Greetings from First United Methodist Church of Los Alamos, New Mexico. We hope this message will be meaningful and relevant to your life and your relationship with God. We invite you to join us for worship on Sunday mornings. We are currently only doing worship online, and you may watch our live stream either on YouTube or on Facebook at 10 a.m. We alternate each week between contemporary and traditional music, and you may find more information on our website, firstinyourheart.org. Now may you be blessed the reading and hearing of God's holy word. Our first scripture reading comes from the first letter to Timothy. The author says that he is going to give instruction so that Timothy may fight the good fight, having faith and a good conscience. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. First of all, then I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving should be made for everyone, for kings and all who are high in, position, in high positions, so that we may lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and dignity. This is right and is acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, there is also one mediator between God and humankind, Christ Jesus, himself human, who gave himself a ransom for all. This was attested at the right time. For this, I was appointed a herald and an apostle. I am telling the truth, I am not lying. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. I desire then that in every place all should pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or argument. Our gospel reading comes from the sixth chapter of Matthew, which is part of the Sermon on the Mount and has even been called the high point of that message as Jesus turns to the topic of prayer. Jesus said, and whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, so that they may be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But whenever you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. When you are praying, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then in this way. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us to the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. This is the good news of Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. A pastor had a small kitten climb up a tree in his yard and got up high enough that it was afraid to come down. And so he went out and used soothing words to try to get it out of the tree, offered it warm milk and food to eat, but the kitten wouldn't come down. And the tree wasn't strong enough to be able to climb, but he thought it was supple enough that he'd be able to pull it down a little bit, try to get the top of the tree closer to the ground where the kitten could then get out. And so he hooked a, a rope up to the tree and up, up to his car, and he started pulling it. And just as he got, thought it's going to be far enough, the rope snapped, and that kitten just took off in the air. He felt terrible. He wandered around the neighborhood looking for the kitten, asking everybody if they had seen a kitten, but, but nobody had seen the cats. 
That afternoon, he went to the, to the grocery store and he saw a member of his congregation and she was loading up her, her cart with cat stuff, but he knew that she hated cats. And so he said, well, what's going on? She said, well, you're not going to believe this, Pastor, but my daughter has been begging me forever to get a cat. And so finally today I said, if God wants us to have a cat, God's going to deliver. And she said, my daughter went out into the backyard and started praying to God to give a cat. And you won't believe it. This kitten came flying through the air and landed in front of her. Never underestimate the power of prayer or of God's sense of humor. So for the past two weeks, we've been working through the core values that we have identified as a congregation that say that who we are. And we've been talking about baptism and what happens when we become a baptized people and how, that, how our core values really come out of our baptismal vows and the act of baptism itself. And if we had gone on a little further two weeks ago when we reaffirmed our baptismal vows, we would have gone into the membership vows of the church. And they are that we are going to support this congregation with our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness. And as I've said before, I think that prayer is at the top of that list. It comes first because it's the most important of those membership vows. It's even more important than our presence of being here in worship and other things, that our faith begins in relationship with God. It begins in prayer. And it's definitely important for being prayerful to be one of our core values. But before we get into what that means, I want us to again say what our core values are. So again, at the end of this, we'll all be able to to say what our core values are. So we are Christ-centered, we are prayerful, we are inclusive, we are growing spiritually, we are compassionate and caring, and we are in service and mission. Now, just as prayer comes first in the membership vows, so too does Christ-centered come first for us in our core values, because the saying that we are Christ-centered centers everything else that we do. It flavors and directs everything else that we do. Because Buddhists pray, Muslims pray, but their prayers are different than the way we pray because they're not praying in Christ or through Christ. We pray Christ-centered prayers. And it's not just individual prayers, but it's also our corporate prayers, the prayers we do as a body of Christ. It's what we do alone, and it's what we do together. And all of those things then are what make us prayerful. And as we're talking about it as being a core value, what that means is that we're going to bathe everything that we do in prayer. That prayer will be a part of every gathering, that when we are seeking to make decisions for the church, that we will go to God in prayer and seeking God's guidance that we're making the right decisions. And nearly everything we do will have prayer as a part of it. And so prayer is at the heart, then, of who we are. John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement, said that prayer is the grand means of drawing near to God. And more importantly, he said, it is the breath of our spiritual life. Prayer is the breath of our spiritual life, which means if we are not praying, our spiritual life, our faith life, will die, because it's not getting the breath of God to give us that life. We cannot be connected to our faith, we cannot be connected to God, we cannot be connected to Christ, we cannot be connected to each other or the Holy Spirit without that means it's sort of important. Now, the writer of 1 Timothy, who was not Paul, believed exactly the same thing. Because he's giving instruction to 1 Timothy. He said, I'm going to tell you about how you live in the faith. And then the first thing he talks about is prayer. And not only does he talk about it first, he says, I'm going to teach you about faith. And then he says, first, you do this. And that thing is to lift up supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings. 
And although he lists all of those things as separate, they all sort of fall under the general category of prayer. And for whom are we to offer these prayers? Everyone, the author of 1 Timothy says. And we do that because God wants to save everyone. And then he specifically says, you should pray for everyone, and then he includes, pray for kings and all who are in high positions. We would say politicians and, and public servants, because the good government is for everyone. And we pray for them, he says, so that we may lead, quiet and lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and dignity. Wouldn't it be great if government was leading us to lead quiet and peaceable lives. Now that we should probably add that peace without justice is not actually peace at all. That goes with our message from last week of being inclusive. But that sense of inclusiveness is part of this injunction from 1 Timothy to pray. Pray for everyone. And that says something significant to us. Because if we're genuinely praying for our enemies, if we are genuinely praying for those who persecute us, as Jesus commands us to do, it's not a suggestion. Jesus say, well, if you kind of get around to it, do this. He says, pray for your enemies and those who persecute you. Not to see the errors of the ways, not for God to harm them, but to pray for God's blessings to be upon them. And what that does is it may change those that we pray for, but I can guarantee you it will change us. An early church father, John Chrysostom, said, No one can feel hatred towards those whom, for whom they pray. You cannot hate those you are praying for. That means to offer prayers as a Christ-centered people means that we have to pray inclusively. It's part of who we are. It's part of what we do because we are baptized. It's not just that we pray, but it's also how we pray. Because what we pray for simultaneously shifts, sh shapes, it simultaneously shapes and expresses our theology. That is, if we only pray for ourselves, we will have a self-centered theology. If we only pray for those that we know or those in the church, it will be a self-centered, inward-focused faith. If we only pray and treat prayer as if it's a wish list, as if God is Santa Claus, or God is Cosmic Butler, as Bishop Willimon says, who's just going to grant us whatever we want or need or desire, then it says a lot about what we think about faith. Because one of the things that prayer should teach us is our innate need and desire for God, and it should also teach us that we are not God. That God does not serve us, but we are called to serve God. Prayer acknowledges that God is God and that God is ultimately in control, that God is ultimately responsible. And so prayer is ultimately confessional. That is not that we make confessions about what we have done, done wrong, although that too is part of prayer, but that our prayers are confessions of faith. Our prayers show us who we are and whose we are and what we believe and what we profess. Because one of the things that prayer should do is that at the heart of it, it should be a self-revealing honesty to God. It should be us burying ourselves and all that we are to God. And we see that in the teaching that Jesus gives in the Sermon on the Mount about prayer, as we heard it this morning. Because after Jesus talks about what hypocrites do in praying, and he says basically, don't pray so that you can be seen by others, not that that's bad, but when you do that so that you might receive applause, or people will think, man, they're a great prayer, or man, they must have a really deep faith. If that's the reason you're praying in public, you're doing it for all the wrong reasons. Go pray in a quiet closet by yourself, Jesus is saying. But then he says something that 
it's crucial, it gets overlooked because we jump from that quote about the hypocrites and we want to get right into the heart of the Lord's Prayer. And Jesus says, your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. And so all that angst that some people have about prayer, they don't know what to say, they're definitely afraid to pray in, in public because they don't pray like other people, they don't have the, the right words, all that angst should just go away. Because Jesus says, God already knows before you even ask Him. So don't worry about the words you're using. Don't worry about your anxiety about prayer. Just go to God in prayer. And because God already knows, then some people might ask, well, what's the purpose then of prayer? If God already knows us, why do I even need to ask? And here's where we can say that prayer is not so much about God as it is about us. That prayer is in some ways like worship. Certainly prayer is a, a form of worship. But we don't worship, we don't gather here on Sunday mornings because God is some egomaniacal narcissist who needs to be told all the time how great he is. Only people with personality disorders need that level of affirmation. We gather for worship because God loves us and God is already doing great things for us. Worship is a response to what God has done. It's a reminder to us of who is in control. It's allowing us to give thanks to God for what God is doing in our lives. Worship helps us to remember that reality of God's presence. And prayer does exactly the same. Prayer centers us in God. But what the Lord's Prayer teaches us, and what we see in it, is that our prayers is, is not about us. Because first Jesus doesn't say, if you pray, he says, when you pray. There is an expectation that prayer is already taking place. And again, it's not just a recommendation. But then if you pay attention, the Lord's Prayer has no eyes in it. There are no first-person pronouns. It's about us and our. Even if you are praying this prayer alone in a closet, you're praying this communal with the body of Christ, the church universal. Because it's not about uh, me or you, it's about us. And then also notice that it doesn't start with us or what we need, but about God. And desiring God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so what it means for us to say that we are prayerful as a congregation is that we too are petitioning. God, help us to bring about the kingdom. Help us for your will to be done here and now. That should be the prayer we are continually seeking from God. The prayer that we offer up as individuals and the prayer we offer up, offer up as a congregation. And that plays a significant role too. Then when we get to thinking about what it means to be in service and in mission. It's what it means to bathe everything we do in prayer and seeking God's guidance. Because as we're thinking about what we're doing or what we should be doing, rarely it's saying, is there some new thing we can do? But instead it's saying, what is God already doing? And how do we participate in that? And then after we talk about what God, what we want for God's will to be done, then we turn to personal issues. And again, it shows us that prayer is not about our dream shopping list, not praying that our team will win this afternoon, but what, other, what is really important and significant and appropriate. As we pray, give us, plural, give us this day our daily bread, an inclusive prayer for everyone to be fed. And that's really the only tangible thing we pray in the Lord's Prayer. Because then it turns to forgiveness, and Matthew's version here, we're using debts instead of forgiveness. But that's really what it's about. And then at the very end of that, then Jesus says, if you don't forgive, you won't be forgiven. And so again, thinking about being a Christ-centered people means that we are living in forgiveness as individuals and as a community. 
So again, it's that seeking of God's guidance and direction for our lives. And then turning away from evil and turning towards the good. And so while the Lord's Prayer can be a guide for us, it can show us the parts of prayer, it can be simply the prayer that we pray because we don't know what else to say. And so if somebody says, can you pray for us? And you're one of those, I, I can't pray in public, I don't know what to say. Say the Lord's Prayer. That will never go wrong for you. But we also have to remember the power of prayer as silence. Not just to give space for the Spirit to intercede for us with sighs too deep for words, as Paul says, but also to give words, space for God to speak to us. Because if we're going to seek God's guidance, then we have to be able to give space for God to answer. Because I'm sure you've probably had people in your lives, you're having a conversation. It's not a dialogue, it's a monologue. They just keep talking, 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 talking. They might even be asking for your, for your advice, but they never stop talking long enough for you to actually be able to say something. And sometimes we do that in our prayers. A Dutch theologian, Soren Kierkegaard, said that the more he prayed, the more he realized that praying wasn't really about talking. That it was just as much, or maybe even more, about listening. And to listen, we have to be silent. And maybe those two words have the same letters for that reason. Being silent and listening to God too is part of prayer. And so if you've spent your prayer life just talking to God, and you're wondering, God never talks back to me, here's your opportunity to spend time in silence with God. And if you go into God in prayer and you don't know what to say, just be silent and just be and let God. And the corollary to that as a congregation that is prayerful is to know that God doesn't just speak to the pastor, doesn't just speak to our elected leaders, and God is speaking to all of us. And so if you think that you're hearing from God and God is saying, this is what you should be doing, you need to voice that as well. And that's part of being inclusive too, is we know that God is speaking to us. We believe that God speaks to us in many and varied ways. And one of the things in being prayerful is to hear God's voice and God's guidance. Because when we are in alignment with God, not only do things go better, but God will provide the resources to make sure that they happen. Prayer is the foundation of our faith. Prayer is the foundation of our commitment to Christ. We can sing about on Christ the solid rock we stand. That rock is built because of our faith, our prayer life. It has to be part of our life as disciples. As the author of 1 Timothy says, first, pray. Pray for everyone, because God wants to save Everyone, pray for our leaders and pray for our enemies. It is the first of our membership vows, and Jesus sets the expectation that we will be praying. Not if you pray, when you pray. Say this. And we'll be praying not just to be heard, not just to praise God, not just to give thanks, but to seek God's guidance in our lives and for the life of the church, and to listen for that guidance. John Wesley said that God does nothing without prayer and everything with us. And so we bathe everything that we do in prayer. But it's not just enough to ask God for things, not just enough to ask for God's guidance. We actually have to act on those things. The prayer is not just talking, not just listening, but prayer is acting in the world of being service and a witness. And so if we're going to be Christ-centered people, if we're going to be a Christ-centered congregation, if we're going to be an inclusive congregation, we have to be a praying congregation. We have to pray individually as part of our faith life, 
And we have to pray as congregation, corporately, as part of our faith life. And we pray for everyone because God wants to save the entire world. God knows what we need before we even go to God in prayer. But that is a reminder that God, the prayer is about us connecting with God, about talking with God, about bearing our souls to God, and about listening to God. So may all that we do be formed and centered in prayer. I pray that it will be so, my brothers and sisters. Amen. Thank you for watching, and don't forget to follow our YouTube channel and Twitter, and like us on Facebook if you haven't already. And remember that every action you take today could change someone's life. So make sure it's a good one, and be an agent of love. God bless.